Welcome to Meet the Biz. Today we have, uh, this is a man who brings me so much joy and to me the, the whole world so much joy just by being Bruce. Mm -hmm. He has that certain kind of effect on people and I, I have to say this morning I was talking to my mom and I told her that I was interviewing Bruce and she said, say hi to Brucey for me. <laughs> so she loves you. And uh, love he's a writer, he's an actor, he uh, does stand up. He's been seen on RuPaul's Drag Race, of course, the Hollywood Squares. He has one of the biggest hearts. Um, Thank you. I, uh, okay, we know who Bruce is, Bruce Valanche. That's why I wore this, because yeah. <laughs> Jewish mothers love me. <laughs> what can I say? I am wearing a t-shirt uh, because <laughs> you are the t-shirt king. I speak my truth. I love it. Exactly. Isn't that great? This was yeah. act actually from uh, the um, Jamie Brewer's play on Broadway. Ah. Um, uh, Oh my goodness, what, uh, Amy what and the Orphans. Ah. At the roundabout, so. Ah, 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 I'm always afraid to wear shirts that say things like that, because I'm afraid people will come up to me on the street and go, I don't give a shit about your truth. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I thought, who needs rejection from strangers? I can get that from friends. Right, or strangers in the night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or family. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and thank you, by the way, what was it? I, I lose track of time, a year or two ago when you, you were the host of the fundraiser for Meet the Biz at the I did. That was where I met your mother, I believe. Yes, it was. Uh-huh. After it was what the Golden Night. Oh. Yeah, yeah it was great. It was a great show. It and was. Jamie Brewer. I screwed up her name that night, and I will never live myself down, because everybody else knew it. <laughs> and I was reading it off a card. Because I was new. No, oh yeah, right. You knew. What, I'm new. What did? Sorry, right, I'm the new girl. Uh, the new girl. I play with my hair now. There. Oh, oh. who wouldn't take? Who I, wouldn't I, take I, career advice from somebody with this hairdo? Today we're learning how to fluff our hair. Fluffing. <laughs> okay, a little this way, a little that way. Let, I, I have to say, when I was. When I was 17, <laughs> um, very, very, I, very. my brother, <laughs> long time ago, but uh, I, I know, uh, my brother introduced me to you through a show. Uh, he, I would always go up to uh, <coughs> in, in, in Reno, Nevada. Yeah. I, I have this, don't you have a cup like this? I think I do, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, a lot of, yes, a lot of penguins having fun. Yes. The other March penguin. I am right. Mm. So my brother introduced yeah. me to different shows and movies, and of course, that HBO special, um, the Bette Midler show. Ah, uh, yeah. And this. And the Avalon. Yes. Oh, I that. Yeah. I know. Right. Does ever does everybody know what an album is? <laughs> That's scary. At, at this point, it's hard to remember. familiar familiar photo. I haven't looked at it in ages, but yeah. Well, I had it. I still have albums. I used to collect them, and and then I realized one of my favorite parts of that show was coming from your soul. Oh well, thanks. And hers. <laughs> and hers. Of I mean, course. I've been collaborating with Beth for. 50 years. Oh my goodness. Home Alone. And I mean, <laughs> Home Alone, contemplating 50 years. Um, yeah, I bet. That, and it goes on. We're still, we're still doing it. But uh, it, that, that was a great one. It was, uh, it really was. And, and like you said, you keep on, you make friends at the beginning and you really, you, work with them and you keep them throughout the years, huh? Yeah, I do. I get, yes, I do. I'm, I'm that sort. But I, I think I'm, <laughs> I'm like that with cars and houses. I mean, I find something I like and I 
I keep it forever. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, it, that's, it's been, I mean, look, there have been a lot of one-off relationships. Don't fool yourself. No. Because it's, it's a weird business filled with insecure people who think it's all going to end overnight. And for some of them, it does. And uh, that tends to, to make a lot of them squirrely and, uh, uh, and, and not necessarily uh, and, uh, uh, floating from flower to flower or looking to be pollinated by somebody else. What is, what, is, what is your advice for people to keep their career going? Uh, you just would say yes. You have to say yes to a lot of stuff. And, uh, and some of it won't work out and some of it will. But uh, I just think you have to, you have to uh, always keep in mind what you really want to do, what makes you happy, where you find your joy, Ooh. Marie Kondo. Uh, <laughs> And ignore the stuff unless you're in, in a circumstance where you have to. If you need the money or if you have some kind of responsibility that has to be uh, addressed, then you do that. But uh, and you just have to keep showing up. You know, you just have to let people know that you are that you are there and and, uh, and what you do has value. I mean, that will demonstrate to them that what you do has value. The fact that you keep showing up. Well, I mean, the value that you have brought to what well, my brain goes to the human race, because <laughs> I, mean, I mean, seriously, I mean, you have not just written for Bet uh, and Cher and Billy Crystal and Robin Williams and Lily Tomlin. You, you write, I mean, you've written, for, I looked at the, the, I knew that you wrote for the Oscars. But I was like looking, I wrote, I, I mean, you, the, the, Oscar, the Academy Awards, the Tony the Awards, the Grammy Awards. The, the, I have the, the EGOT of award show writers. I've written them all. The Emmys, the Grammys, the Oscars, the Tonys, and a whole lot of others that haven't made it to that pantheon of yeah. award show madness. <laughs> what is it about that you like? Why do you like doing that? Well, it, uh, it's something I kind of fell into because uh, I, I was a journalist. I mean, I was an actor and I was a journalist and I was writing, I started writing for Bet at the beginning. Uh, and I began writing for other people as a result of that. And I, so I was writing for a lot of uh, uh, people who had a, a persona that, um, uh, that you could write for. They had a stage character and um, so when I came out, I, in 1975, I came out here to Hollywood yeah. with the Manhattan Transfer, which was a, a group that uh, Bet's dresser's brother, Tim Hauser, had started. Yeah. And I, I worked with them on their act. And then uh, we sold a television show, a, a TV series. It was a summer TV series replacing Cher, and, uh, who I'd also written for. And so I came out here on a leave of absence to, to write the Transfer show. And I stayed. And what happened right about then was variety television began to die because cable came in. Mm -hmm. And when I came out here, there was the Carol Burnett show and the Dean Martin show and the Mac Davis show, the Andy Williams show. All those things went away because you could get that kind of stuff on cable 24-7. Yeah. And it was yeah. also kind of an old school of, of entertainment. Then, and cable was giving you uncensored new school stuff. So if you wanted to see M Madonna's concert, you could see it on HBO. Uh, and you could also, they'd repeat it. You could see it whenever, you know. So that, that signified the death knell of the variety series. And also SNL came on at the same time and they were late at night and they were doing stuff that was, that the cable more or less were doing. And, uh, so you couldn't really compete because the audience that was interested in that was either very square and old or they were very young and hip and they didn't want what you were doing would never come up to their level of, of sophistication for a better word. Mm -hmm. Anyway, what happened was the variety, the variety uh, format segued into event programming. It became awards, award shows, specials, tributes, all that kind of stuff. And because I wrote for people specifically when they were being themselves on stage or their character that they had used on stage, uh, 
I, I could write for those shows because I wasn't constructing you know, dialogue. I wasn't constructing uh, uh, plot, long line plots, that kind of stuff. So I, there was, and suddenly there was a market for that. So I began writing a lot of that kind of stuff. And uh, uh, it was never an intention of mine, but I fell into it. And I, I always say uh, playwrights or screenwriters who just focus on that uh, have a much more difficult job in that they have to create the characters and make the characters live. And I'm already handed a character. Um, you know, when when uh, Billy Crystal comes on stage, there is a, there's a, a person Billy Crystal is when he's on stage. Yeah. Lily Tomlin, uh, there is a per we had to invent a person for Lily to be because she was always characters. The same with Whoopi. Whoopi was characters, and they were actresses who did character stuff, and then had to find a stage persona for themselves to be when they were just being themselves. And so I was a part of all of that, and uh, um, it just seemed to fit at the time. It was, uh, I don't know what would have happened. I, I keep saying, I would have become Neil Simon, but you know, I didn't. I mean, I, and I, I it, it never, I mean, I wrote a lot of screenplays that didn't get made and all of that, but, uh, this stuff kept happening and it continues to happen. So, and you, so you said yes. So I said yes. <laughs> but then, then after 20 years of that, I suddenly became an on screen presence with Hollywood Squares. And right. they have a head writer and they made, they put me into the square to the left of Whoopi, if that's possible. <laughs> and, and we were there. They, I think they thought I would tame her, but they didn't realize that. Uh, that you stuck in the. Uh... Well, they didn't realize that she was really uh, a, a Jewish gay guy and I'm really a black woman. <laughs> Ask anybody who slept with me, they'll tell you. <laughs> but uh, uh, it just, it just, you know, I, I kind of inherited the Paul Lynn Square and, uh, and worked that for six years. And, that, and that, as a result, I was on TV every night and so I became a famous person. Do you enjoy being in front of the camera or behind? Oh yeah, that was what I always wanted to do. I mean, I was, I always wanted, I was a child actor. I was never a child star yeah, or we'd yeah. be having this conversation in rehab. Right. I was, but I always was performing. And so, uh, um, yeah, it was what I really wanted to do. The writing is, is very lonely. Even the kind of writing I do, which is largely collaborative. Yeah. You yeah. work with a room full of people a lot of the time. But at some point, you are forced to sit down and face the blank screen. It used to be the blank page, but I'm so I'm so au courant. It's the blank screen, right now. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it's kind of lonely, and and uh, you're the only one laughing when you write something funny until you hear it performed. And when you're performing, you hear it all the time if it's funny, and you get that instant gratification, which I enjoy. <laughs> right, I don't right. know about the rest of you. Instant gratification suits me fine. But I, it's also fun to write. I find that when I'm writing and I'm really into it, I get into what I call the alpha state, which is where you, you kind of zone out everything else that's going on. And uh, you, are, you are into the, the moment of, of what you're doing or into the characters you're writing or into the story you're writing. And I think that's what all writers, all real writers experience. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them will go to extremes to get to the alpha state. I mean, misery is about a guy who goes and gets, has to go to a cabin in the middle of nowhere to sit down and write these romance novels. You know, fortunately, I've, I've not taken it that far. I don't know, I mean, I don't know Stephen King. I've met him once, but I, I don't know if that's actually how he works, if he has a place up in Castle Rock that he goes to and there are guard dogs who look like Cujo. And, <laughs> And nobody's allowed in until he finishes whatever he's doing. He writes an awful lot. He's in, he's incredibly prolific. So I mean, I, people who are like that, I wonder what the rest of their lives are like. If there is a rest of their life, I don't know. But I know I'm a very social person, and uh, well, and I think that probably not work for me. So I have to create that alpha alpha zone for myself. I think to the mix of being social and also being focused on on the writing makes you who you are. You know, I, I mean, the other reason I, I wore this Speak the Truth is I remember when you did the class years ago, the Meet the Biz class at the uh, Inclusion Films, Joy yeah. and it hit me that 
that night, how honest and just you, whatever you were asked, you answered it. You just said what was on your mind. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know? Well, that's and partially it, a function of, of being an older blonde. Well, <laughs> well, it's, it was like- You might as well, I mean, you might as well take the liberty of saying what you think, because a lot of times, you, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be aged out of things. Mm. I mean, the ageism is really, is terrible. I mean, they, you, if, unless, unless you're iconic, which I, I have the fortune of sort of being iconic in certain circles, but uh, it, it's very difficult. I mean, they, they, they don't get your references. And so you have to bone up on, on what they would get in order to, uh, to make It doesn't make sense to me. It do, I mean, here, here we have like gold, you know, uh, with the people who happen to get older, which hopefully we all will. And, um, and people saying, no, 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 you know, a lot well, of times. The irony, to me, the irony is I always felt that way. When I was younger, I always venerated the people who'd gone before. And I was fascinated and I, I seemed to run with a crowd that, that felt the same way. We all were more interested in what was going on uh, with the people before us. And I, as I've gotten older, I've sensed a shift and that may just be the way of things yeah. that younger people, but it seems to me that younger people today aren't really all that interested in what happened before. They, it, if it didn't happen to them, it didn't happen. I think that the internet and, and social media has, has created narcissism uh, central and everybody is, it, it's all about me and it's all about, and it, it's all about taking pictures of me mm. and posting those, and they disappear. I mean, it ju just shows you just how transitory it is. Yeah, There's, somebody's made a billion dollars inventing a system for pictures that will disappear. <laughs> just this moment, boom. Well, I mean, here so we it, are. It, I think it it just it feeds that one element of of our personality. Uh, it overfeeds it. And I, I think that, that that's the, the result of it. But what, what, just if I can go on for a yeah, minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On. As, <clears throat> as a writer, what I've noticed is it's very difficult to write contemporary stories because they all involve people staring at screens. And one of the reasons I think we're seeing this tremendous interest in period stuff, in, in anything that went in Game of Thrones, these are all things that that let us use old plot devices that don't work anymore in the real world because we don't live that way anymore. I mean, to do a mystery where uh, somebody didn't know where somebody else was or a mistaken identity, when anybody can go Google anything, I mean, that kills the story. So let's do a, let's do something set in a period where that doesn't apply and occasionally you'll find somebody uh taking the challenge and and creating something like knives out which is a traditional mystery that's set in a contemporary uh, setting uh, but uses all of the old tropes and that had in fact makes fun of them so i think that was part of the of the reason why it was such a success anyway okay no i love Except, it I, i've shot my wad on that oh, no, i love it Brilliant, yeah, that's why. Uh, what is, by the way, you mentioned joy. What is your biggest joy? <laughs> I can't say here. No! <laughs> no. Uh, it's, it's pretty big. Oh. <laughs> uh, oh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I guess ma I'm making people laugh, I suppose. It's something I've been doing since I was a kid. And uh, 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 I don't know, anything that gives you that feeling of, uh, of well being and the sense that the world isn't going to end, especially right now when the world is actually ending. So, yeah, you know, it's, I feel like we're in an extended mini series of On the Beach, <laughs> where, where, which is a reference that, that, that younger people won't get, but they should look it up because it's very relevant right now. That's, that's, that's your assignment. Go, go check out On the Beach. It's a novel that was written in the 50s about the end of the world. And this is pretty close. <laughs> okay. It was, a, it was, I should say, it was a big bestseller and it was a big hit movie. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, if I said Gregory Peck, Ava Gardner, and Fred Astaire were in it, 
those are all legendary Hollywood names that may mean nothing to uh, people who are far younger than I, but it, it was a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I, here we have the internet and here we are able to learn so much at, the, at our fingertips. And like you said, a lot of people just, Mm. Just me, but uh, I'm going to throw out a name. I want you to give me your yeah. thought. The Cheshire Cat. <laughs> well, <laughs> well I have somewhere here, it seems <laughs> to me I have. Do you mean this Cheshire Cat? Yes. That I refrigerator magnet I use as a paperweight. <laughs> It's my favorite character. It's uh, from Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. And of course, it's the Disney Cheshire Cat, who is a very uh, sort of uh, Terry Thomas. There's another one that uh, you, can, you can Google. Uh, of course, he's, I don't, I don't think he did the Cheshire Cat, but he was certainly uh, a, that smile. a human version, version of the Cheshire Cat. Uh, he's um, uh, very cool and very laid back, and that's because he's stoned. <laughs> one of Lewis, he's one of Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland characters. He's always smoking a hookah. Yeah, and uh, and he, uh, you know, whenever when anybody appears before him, he just he appears. He's invisible. Then he suddenly appears in a tree. He's a big pink striped cat, and says, "Who are you?" What What about him turned you on? Uh, his his laid back coolness. And his implacability, nothing, nothing in Wonderland phased him. It was, and he could, uh, he could come and go at will. He was invisible. He could disappear. And he was pink. You know, <laughs> I was attracted to pink, and not in the Larry Flint hustler way, right. but uh, I was attracted to all. You know, the the I don't know. The color just got me. It does to this day. I mean, I'm not crazy with think pink. You know, right. it's like I don't, I don't have you know, a pink house. Jane Mansfield had that. Yeah, she had the Pink Palace on Sunset, but um, and she had and the one in well, never mind. But uh, but uh, uh, that's well, why do you bring him up? Did I mention him? Well, to you? I remember we hung out one day, and you you had I saw that magnet, and I saw uh, uh, yeah. you know, and I know that you love the Cheshire Cat, so I brought it up. It's like, hmm, I wonder why what. What about the Cheshire Cat? You know, because I I have a few things. I just they're not they're not near me now. Yeah. Another little uh, a, they, Disney made a uh, a teacup. It's actually a coffee mug, and it's in two parts. And the and the, the it's a Cheshire Cat. His head is the top of it. Oh right! So he disappears. And, yeah. 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 I've got that, and uh, and there's. Uh, and there's a, a, an actual Cheshire Cat paperweight that I, know, I, I think it might have uh, bro gotten broken in the, in the downsizing, in the move when I sold my house. Oh. And you know, and I had to really do a Marie Kondo. I had to get rid of everything that didn't bring me joy. Right. And, th and put a lot of it in storage. Then you discover that you've been living for six years without things you thought you couldn't live without. Yeah. And you're yeah. doing damn well without them. And that's the time when you have to go to the storage unit and, and do like, you know, a Leonardo DiCaprio at the end of, and you just take the flamethrower. <laughs> I actually, well, I just finished. I had 60 boxes and I cut them down to 20. Wow. In my living room. Oh my, in your, in your living room, I know. In my living room. It's uh, funny now how, it's funny, are you doing what I'm doing, which is like, yeah, I, I'm actually pretty good at keeping the house you know, neat, and uh, and, and, uh, and I said, oh, I don't want to leave that there. It'll, be, it'll look terrible. Then who's coming in? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody's coming. Only on. me. If I can make, if I can apologize to myself, I can <laughs> leave those cartons of diet snapple on the hall floor rather than having to just schlep them into a closet. Then I'll sit there. Who's going to give a rat's ass? Yeah, especially now until we get out of this quarantine thing. If you still have your Cheshire Cat Halloween costume, we have to go. Oh, I do. Yes, I do. I, I have my. I don't know that it fits. We didn't really. No. I don't know that it ever fit, but I kept it because it was just so. 
who, I mean, who gets rid of a thing like that? You never know. You never know. You never know. Um, you know, there's another thing that I've noticed lately uh, on, on social, the social network, that you have, it's a bittersweet kind of thing. Uh, it's another credit to your name, a bittersweet one. It brings a healing to those who read it. Um, and you write obituaries. Oh, I do. <laughs> for, and, but it's such a healing thing for people. Uh, I, I guess it is. Uh, it hadn't occurred to me. It's just, uh, um, I, I write them about people who I actually knew. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and of course, you know, all of those things, when you speak at funerals or anything like that, are you, they're always about you. They're always about your relationship with the, the departed. And, uh, and uh, sometimes it's just to sort of give them a final salute. A lot of times it's people who are not terribly well known, uh, but they were, they were well known to me. Uh, I've kind of dialed back on doing it about big timers unless I really was in a, and really was close with them. Or, or, I mean, in that case, I don't have to. What I notice is anytime anybody famous dies, everybody has a, a picture that they, and now they have a selfie that they, they cajoled out of them yeah. uh, at some, on uh, some red carpet or at some reception or at a stage door. And it's always them and this person with that frozen smile. <laughs> right. You know, like not really happy to be in the picture, but not wanting to say no. And I said, when Joan Rivers died, you know, every motherfucker on the planet had a picture of themselves with Joan Rivers because she would always say yes. And, and, uh, and so they're all posting these things like, yeah, my pal Joan. And what was sad was that even people who actually did know her and work with her, they had to post. I mean, and I thought, okay, well, that's it. I'm not writing anything about Joan. And uh, uh, I don't think I did. Or you know, I, I don't do it as much lately. Uh, but, um, but it's I, interesting, too, because a lot of people I, I would read, sometimes it's like, I want you to write one about me. So I, I was know. thinking... In 42 years, <laughs> I want you to write one about me. All right, um, you're on. Okay. You're on. I was thinking about, I mean, some of them say, oh, that's a sweet remembrance and all that. So it is, there won't be, a, there won't be a chance to remember anything more with them. So you might as well do it while it's hot. <laughs> right. I do have to say that just knowing you, it was interesting because the first time I met you, it's like, you know, Bruce Valant, and then, and I think it was me too, because, you know, coming, coming to Hollywood from a little town, you're sort of like, oh, oh, that, just, especially for the first year, but then I just like, got over myself, or I sort of learned about, oh yeah, okay, and I learned about this connection with people, and you really, throughout the years, you've taught me it's okay to be me, even though, I am sort of shutting off what I'm saying here with a shirt or something. Well, I'll have to talk to the therapist about that. But um, I just thank you for that because you you do that in more than well, you know. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, thank you. <clears throat> I think it was uh, it was a, um, it came to me from Bette Midler. Uh, I was very. Uh, she said in, in this movie they made about me called Get Bruce. I love that. Produced by Harvey Weinstein, who never laid a hand on me. <laughs> I'm going to have, I want to have a hashtag, why not me? <laughs> there I was with the bathrobe open, ready, but. In that movie, Beth says, I was, I, I was very cranky. She said, but she, when I met him, I was, he was really cranky. And I thought, this guy's going to drag me down. And, uh, and then I changed, and what changed me basically was working with her, watching her, uh, when she got on stage and the effect that she had on audiences, she let, them, she let them know that who you are is fabulous because she would come up, the, come up there and uh, we would make fun of the fact that everything was tacky. She was the last of the truly tacky women. I'm, you know, I'm not Karen Carpenter. I'm not, this, I'm not a perfect person. 
ad, she would say, uh, well, we're going to do, we, we searched far and wide for this medley. We got two, two. <laughs> and it was always, it was a lot of self-deprecating stuff, but the audience identified with her and they realized that who she is was fabulous and who they are is fabulous. And I can't tell you the number of people who have said to me over the years, uh, seeing that Bette Midler concert changed my life. It made me feel like I could be who I really am. And that was how, I, that, she did that to me uh, over the course of working with her. And uh, so if I could pass that on, if I could pay it forward, if we can make a Kevin Spacey reference, <laughs> if I can pay it forward, yeah. uh, and, uh, then, I'm, then I'm delighted. And, you know, it couldn't make, that brings me joy. Thank <laughs> you.